we have we have with us this afternoon our colleagues um, associated with the Earth Group on Earth Observation, GEO, Disaster Risk Reduction Working Group. We have Christy, Coyle, Nathaniel Newman, Marcus, and Sheila, and they will introduce themselves. We This afternoon, we will be looking at big data for better, better decision making, disaster risk reduction, and climate change resilience for small island developing states. Now, this is very, very um, critical to what we do here in the Faculty of the Built Environment at the University of Technology, Jamaica. I also want to um, let you know that this is the beginning of uh, our new relationship, both with um, Lacey and with, with Gio and um, other colleagues out of Canada. And you will be hearing more of our new relationship as we develop over the, the, the coming months. And so to begin, we have this um, seminar, this discussion. So uh, my name is Carol Archer. I'm a professor of public policy and urban planning here in the faculty of the built environment. And my responsibility is to coordinate these um, seminar series. I will be the moderator for this afternoon. We will be here for about an hour, an hour and a half. Um, we will have the presentations and we will open for question answers and conversation. So over to you, um, Nathaniel, Marcos, Christy, and Sheila. Thank you so much, Carol. And and uh, yeah, thanks for that introduction. And uh, just a few words to say, uh, it's a great pleasure to uh, speak to you today um, on behalf of uh, the team here that you'll you'll get to meet through uh, today's presentation. And uh, yeah, thanks for arranging and planning um, the opportunity to speak today. So I'll just share my screen here. And if everything works well, I'll... Can you, can everyone see that? We can see Life? and Great. we can hear, yes. Excellent, okay. So as Carol mentioned, uh, the presentation today is focused on big data to better decisions, looking at disaster risk reduction and climate resilience over the long term for small island developing states. Now, when we think of big data, we think of large complex data that might be uh, machine readable, not necessarily uh, person readable, human readable. Um, but in, in general terms, it, it applies to, uh, to a mix or hybrid of, of these different data types. And, and so when we really focus on Earth observation today, but um, in, the, in the background is uh, the integration of other forms of data, uh, ground-based data like climate and weather stations, um, early warning systems, uh, sensors, drones, and a lot of the new, new monitoring surveillance technologies. So, so small island developing states around the world as we know, or especially in Latin America and the Caribbean, are particularly vulnerable to climate change and natural disasters. And as Carol's mentioned, this group on Earth observations, uh, Disaster Risk Reduction Working Group, which is an international um, group of, of experts, really, is seeking to collaborate with J Jamaica um, experts, subject matter experts, and leaders to really look at long term capacity in using Earth observational information for um, increasing disaster resilience. And so in the talk today, uh, I'll give a couple slides of introduction, then I'll hand it over to Marcus to focus more on the systemic risk issues uh, in the Caribbean. Uh, Sheila will then look at Earth observation for risk assessment and climate change mitigation. And finally, Christy will look at integrated solutions to action, actionize science, you know, partnerships to enhance capacity using Earth observation data. And really, I think today is to, to share ideas and feedback uh, from you, we're, we're hope, hoping to get uh, on potential benefits and opportunities uh, for integrating Earth observational information into a disaster risk reduction and resilience. Um, we said national there, but maybe at a variety of different scales. Well, I won't spend too much time on myself, but I'm a research scientist based in the government of Canada in a department of agriculture and agri-food, as well as statistics. I'm based in Western Canada. If uh, any of you know Vancouver, the Western Canada, um, I'm quite near there in a place called Summerland, um, and we have a research station 
situated there. I'm also an adjunct professor uh, in geography with the University of Victoria, Canada. A lot of the work I do is quantitative and risk modeling, but it uh, covers quite a broad range of problems. And um, a lot of them tie in, as you'll hear today, with, with global um, you know, sustainable development needs. Um, I do also work with Earth observation data um, and latest methodologies, uh, machine learning methodologies. And I have a number of appointments internationally with uh, statistical associations, as well as being a co-chair of the group on Earth Observations Disaster Risk Reduction Working Group. So what is this group on Earth Observations? Well, it's an intergovernmental partnership that improves the availability, access, and use of Earth observation data you know, for sustainability of our planet. And it connects and guides about 112 members, which includes many hundred gov uh, national government agencies from UN member states and 135 participating organizations and 15 associates. So it's a very broad ranging um, you know, partnership. The particular working group that I'm involved in is, has really been formed to develop and implement what we call coherent and cross-cutting approach um, across both the Group on Earth Observations work program, but also with partners um, you know, to, in, in terms of seeing action from uh, the use of Earth observation data and the science that integrates with it. So there's been a number of developments of this working group. Um, they've come up with an Earth observation risk toolkit that is, uh, has a start, but is being further enhanced and also uh, has a number of contributing papers to the UN Global Assessment Report of uh, 2022. And there's a number of other uh, scientific papers um, and policy briefs, this other kind of content. Really what we're focusing on here is systemic risk and the nature and scale of risk has really changed. Um, it's increasingly complex, interconnected. And what we mean by systemic really is, is sort of cascading risks and impacts. Uh, you have maybe a variety of different risk drivers, we call it, whether it's pandemic, poverty, climate change, population growth. And these are all occurring in different ways, right? Both spatially and, and over time. Some are more short term, other are longer term. And it's particularly important when you look at full ecosystems because um, you, know, you have one impact, but it can cascade into health, it can cascade into infrastructure. And uh, you know, the, the area where I do a lot of work is the agricultural or food sector. And so we're looking at ways to work together across these sectors, across spatial temporal scales to really try and solve this more complex problem of systemic risk. And there's particular features of uh, small island developing states where it's, it's particularly amplified, where you have increasing density of population, a, a stronger reliance on infrastructure and the need for further development. There's uh, you know, a, a wider range of climate related hazards. Um, but that being said, you know, a lot of this work, we're hoping uh, Canada itself can learn from um, and strengthen its emergency response to disasters, uh, floods and, and these kind of things. Um, we, all aware that the, the projected effects of climate change in terms of temperature and precipitation, and uh, there's still a, quite a range of uncertainty and a lack of predictability. So this is a common aim as well among member states. Uh, climate data and resulting actionable climate knowledge is but one key component and should be developed and better utilized across uh, different countries. Many of you may know of the uh, United Nations Office Disaster Risk Reduction, the UNDRRs, and its 10-day framework for disaster risk reduction um, lasting up to 2030, um, it looks at sort of an integrated risk of hazard, vulnerability, and exposure components. And it's, yeah, the first major agreement of the post-2015 development agenda, which really looks at, um, you know, concrete actions for pr protecting uh, member states of the UN from risk of disaster. So anything from understanding, research on the basic understanding of disaster risk, strengthening risk governance, to looking at areas of broader resilience across different sectors and uh, looking at build back better, recovery, rehabilitation and reconstruction. I'll just mention it briefly, but there is a Asquelantes Declaration Joint Action Plan, um, which brings together, <coughs> excuse me, a number of stakeholder working groups, um, the UN um, Geospatial Information Management, the GGIM, <coughs> Working Group on Disasters, and a number of other partners with uh, the Group on Earth Observations, Amerigeo, America Disasters Working Group. Um, and the goal, common goal here is of mutually advancing regional integration of geospatial data and Earth observational information, again, for disaster risk reduction across the Americas. So, you know, Canada, America, 
South America, including La um, Latin and Caribbean countries. Uh, the shared priorities will include the improved uptake and use of geospatial, statistical, and Earth observational insights. And so we're really, you know, trying to frame what, it, where's the capacity building that's needed? Um, how can different countries work together to set standards, uh, raise awareness, share data, make it discoverable, shareable, and usable? And I won't go into this. I think we'll hear it from my colleagues um, in their slides. But just to point out that yes, as, as Carol's mentioned, there is emerging collaboration. And there's been some background work that Marcus has done and others on um, looking at um, gaps, you know, areas where we can uh, focus our, our efforts. And uh, Sheila has recently done, uh, led an analysis of natural hazards and risk assessment in, for Jamaica, so looking at opportunities and challenges. And we have a number of uh, collaborators, including uh, Carol um, there, but also Michelle Edwards, um, who's involved in the uh, Office of Disaster Preparedness and Emergency Management, or OPDEM, and also Simone Lloyd, who's actually a Jamaica Senda focal point, um, and also, uh, I guess, part of the coordinator, sorry, for the National Emergency Response GIS team there. So, um, and they've been involved in through the various capacities at developing a tool called the Jamaica Systemic Risk Assessment Tool. And so uh, that's one of the areas we're hoping that uh, we might be able to integrate some Earth observational information and um, and work in enhancing that, as well as tie it in again with this EO risk tool that the working group, GEO working group has been putting together. So looking at ways we can work together and strengthen what we're doing. And just to, uh, before I hand it over to Marcus, um, LACI, for anyone who doesn't know, is an initiative uh, for enhancing capacity of climate risk assessment, catalyzing partnerships to inform decisions in Latin America and the Caribbean. And, um, I guess we'll hear a little bit more on that. Uh, it's a sort of a partnership from the US Global Change Research Program, US Group on Earth Observations or GEO, AmeriGEO, and also the Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research. So again, quite a number of partners uh, working together in, in catalyzing partnerships and, and trying to look at the systemic risk and other risk issues. All right, over to Marcus, thank you. All right. So who is this, Marcus? Um, I'm I'm wearing a few different hats right now, um, largely trying to close the gap between research, between academia, um, consultation work, technical assistance of uh, of governments, of international organizations, um, and the humanitarian community. Uh, I think you will get these slides anyway, so feel free to to read the rest. The rest of my slides is more exciting. Uh, so I've been uh, a coordinating lead author on the uh, recent global assessment report on disaster risk reduction. And that was quite an interesting endeavor because the systemic risk story in the previous uh, GAR report um, was a term that sounded very exotic, right? And uh, the, the last GAR that you can download if you just point your phone at the at this QR code, or, to, or you just Google GAR, UNDRR, you'll find it anyways immediately. The interesting thing was really that the last GAR report focused on systemic risks. And so after this introduction from Nathaniel, I thought it would make sense to sort of explain this a bit further in, in the most tangible way that I can think of what we really mean with systemic risk. And so uh, I thought of the most obvious uh, systemic risk that we're facing right now. So um, I'm working a lot in food security, um, using geospatial information to uh, assess risks, um, close the gap between the hazard information and the socioeconomic impact. And so obviously countries like Somalia, uh, they are highly vulnerable to any kind of climate shock for many different reasons, but they are also very uh, susceptible to uh, what's happening in other countries, and I'll explain this in a minute. So uh, you might have heard that uh, there was an invasion uh, in the Ukraine. And so how did that actually affect Somalia? So first of all, more than 50%, almost 60% of, of food commodities in Somalia are uh, imported. In addition, there was the sixth failed consecutive rainy season. 
So six failed rainy seasons in a row that reduced the overall agricultural production. But at the same time, also the imports were lower. The question is why? Of course, geopolitics always plays a role. That led to war, led to a lower production in Russia and the Ukraine, and a lower export. And these two factors, actually three, contributed to what we're seeing right now. Between 30 and 40 million people are currently affected by food insecurity in the larger Eastern Africa region, in the larger Horn of Africa. So it's not only climate, it's not only war, it's not only food prices, and it's not only export or import related questions. It's different elements coming together in a cascading, in a com compounding way. So these are the struggles that we're facing these days. Talking about systemic risk leads directly to different instruments that we can use to um, increase resilience. And so when we talk about disaster risk reduction resilience, obviously there are many different players and that's not at all a hierarchy, right? So I think the, the first and the, the most important group in the entire chain, in the entire decision-making workflow is always the people who are suffering. It's always the vulnerable communities, communities at risk. Government plays a huge role linking policy to, to technical work, to community work, uh, NGOs as implementing partners, all the insights need to come from somewhere, right? So in most cases, they come from academia, from research institutions, national, regional, international, civil society, the public plays a huge role, international organizations, international Red Cross, different UN organizations, but also the media and several other groups that we are not listing here. And so bringing all these people to the table, to one big table is in many cases, first of all, it's not easy, but then again, there are many different other issues that might not be obvious right from the beginning. People might have different agendas in mind. People might have a different jargon. They might have different concerns and they might be faster or slower in building trust with others, right? So I've been thinking like in the, in the center of, of, of my slides, these are two things that I, I would want you to, to remember. Like, we are bombarded with slides and death by PowerPoint. So if there's nothing that you remember, and I would fully understand it in a year, just remember these two things. Risk is never zero and natural disasters don't exist. And what I'm actually meaning by that is imagine driving a car, right? And I'm not making any, any, any polls or any service here, but just think for five seconds, how do you control the risk of getting injured in a car? And is there an analogy with risk management at the larger scale, at the non-individual scale? So in the case of a car, I would say that's that's not a, a that's a non-exhaustive list, of course. But you, first of all, you could learn to drive, right? Because that reduces the risk of, of having having an accident. You can wear a seatbelt, you can drive more slowly, you can drive carefully, but even that does not guarantee you that there won't be an accident. So you might put an additional layer of protection on top, and that would be insurance, for instance, right? So how does that work with a region or a country uh, or a province or a community? Very similar in many ways, right? So uh, you first of all, before we start preparing ourselves, before we start offsetting and, and, um, and mitigating, mitigating risks, we need to understand them. We need to understand how they interact, where they are, uh, at what times they are the highest. Um, if two different risks can um, result in a socioeconomic impact that is far larger than these two combined. Um, in that sense, one and one equals three. That's exactly what we've seen during the times of COVID, right? There are many low hanging fruits, uh, raising awareness and preparing for, the, for a certain shock. Uh, WMO, the World Meteorological Organization, is putting a lot of, of energy into um, a global initiative to cover every person on this planet with an early warning system. Um, that's definitely manageable. The problem is that covering a person and this person knowing that, they're, they're, that something is coming, practically covering this last mile, between the generation of information and the communication and, and reception of information, understanding this information and being able to act uh, upon it is a different story. 
And then, of course, I mean, you, you might know this, uh, there are different sovereign level or risk pooling mechanisms that aim to transfer regional or national risks on a global reinsurance market. Because, of course, uh, for a global reinsurance market, it's a lot easier to compensate the, the shocks that are happening in a region or, or, a, or a country, particularly if it's a smaller country. So usually we're talking about very complex systems, but at the end of the day, it's a very binary decision, right? It is a binary decision, right? Yes or no. So we might start with petabyte or exabytes of, of data. Satellite data by nature often lead to large data volumes. But at the end of the day, the question is yes or no. Trigger an insurance payout or not? Evacuate people or not? Many other decisions are binary in that sense, but this is just to highlight that this inverted pyramid in most cases holds true. Many decision-making processes, many data sets are coming together, um, coming together in the sense that they are either analyzed in parallel or they are really combined. But at the end of the day, a decision-maker needs to decide. And this is exactly the gap that we need to close because there are different uh, people working at, at different ends of the spectrum. Some people are working in the, the development of the data. Some are translating the data into knowledge and others are, are really building uh, decision-making systems. And then there's a fourth group that's actually making the decision. With regard to Earth observation, um, most Earth observation data are unfortunately used in the response phase. There is so much potential in, in mapping risks and communicating risks. Um, which means that we need to be a lot more forward-looking, particularly in more vulnerable areas. More forward-looking, what does that mean? Uh, if you imagine there are 100 emergencies, I would be pretty confident to say that we can, um, that we can predict between 20 and 50%. I was pretty optimistic here. Like, so let's say we can predict 50%. The problem is that only between 1% and 3% are covered with forward-looking systems. So in many cases, we know that things will happen and we don't do anything because it's a, it's a political bottleneck. It's often a financial bottleneck. And many donors are afraid of putting money into a system that triggers payout based on the probability of an impact in the face of many emergencies already happening right now. And the humanitarian and the disaster risk reduction system already suffering uh from from limited funding and so one issue that i see in my day-to-day -day work uh in in uh, very frequently is that we are decoupling data from the actual application right and that can have fatal very dangerous consequences um if the data set does not match the application we automatically have a problem just look at that. So that's that's a real data set. Uh, that's um, a seasonal uh, climate prediction, a seasonal rainfall prediction. So I'm pretty confident that during the summer months between June and August 23, Central America, the Dry Corridor, and several Caribbean islands will face uh, a negative rainfall anomaly. But look at the size of these pixels. Look at the size of Look at the at the coarseness of the predictions that we can make. If you are a decision maker and you want to prepare for flood or for drought or for whatever at the sub-national level, which is usually what you want to do, right? You can't tell everyone to evacuate. You can tell everyone, oh no, a flood is coming or a drought is coming. You need to be more granular in your decision making, your policy making, right? So if we want to really link data into an operational workflow, this is something that definitely needs to be considered. Luckily, Earth observation data tend to have a far higher resolution, far higher spatial resolution, and also temporal resolution than these large-scale global ensemble models, but it serves as a very good use case. Um, together with Jacqueline Spence from uh, Jamaica's Met Office and Denise Duki, a former colleague of mine, we wrote a paper in 2019. Again, you can download it uh, via this QR code. Uh, and I'm not walking you through these, these many words and many bullet points. This is just to show that uh, we actually made the attempt to understand how the information flow is actually working, right? Uh, 
where does it start? Where does it end? Where are feedback loops? Where are limitations? And where are the bottlenecks that we actually need to that we actually need to um, consider when we are developing new systems? So, what are the actual limits uh, when it comes to the use of Earth, Earth observation data in Jamaica? On the one hand, of course, I mean topography, sometimes data quality is a problem. Uh, in any case, we need to link the hazard information, whatever hazard that may be. Could be drought, could be flood, could be landslides, could be pretty much anything. But we need it to link it to some kind of socioeconomic baseline. If we never know the impact, if we have no proper loss inventory uh, at the at a suitable spatial resolution, it will be very hard to to link the hazard to the impact information. In many cases, we've seen that the the responsibilities are unclear and the the workflows sometimes duplicated, uh, sometimes decoupled from each other. There is a clear need for capacity building to, to develop more tailored instruments. A large part of my work is pointing people in directions. Basically, uh, I'm, I'm often facing issues with, uh, with stakeholders, often with governmental stakeholders, saying that they need to do, they need to inform some kind of decision making process. Um, and therefore, they would need a lot of money to develop this and that new tool. In many cases, these data sets or tools or instruments. They exist, they might not exist in this particular context, but if they exist in a different context, they can be adapted. And then again, very, very important, again, this hazard and impact story. Um, this also has a risk modeling component that is related to Earth observation data. And the reason why I'm saying this is because we are we're in, living in an age where we have more than 35, sometimes 40 years of data, but that does not mean that the next agricultural season or the next year will mimic any of the years that we have on record. So for instance, developing some kind of synthetic data set, assuming that we have not only 40 years on record from the Earth observation data sets, but we had 10,000 years uh, and we could apply our risk modeling and your risk estimations uh, based on these 10,000 years makes the entire decision-making process a lot more robust. And then finally, there's the, there's a the clear call uh, for better international co collaboration because there is this gap between data providers and what we consider actionable knowledge. Um, there's a clear demand to connect science and policy making through dedicated workshops, also something that we're that we're working on right now. Um, convergence of evidence can help, but that means we need different data sets that are that are independent from each other. And claiming that data should be better is just not enough. We need the infrastructure and uh, the technical capacities to, to make something out of these data. I have one more slide, I'll be very quick. Um, we also already talked about the SWOT and the network analysis. Of course, it makes sense to understand who we're actually talking to and who's interacting with you beyond just the, the Met Office. There are many different players that have uh, a clear expertise in their, uh, that is relevant for DRR and for resilience building in the country. Um, and then ultimately, of course, um, piloting some advanced technologies that could also be uh, mobile-based technologies to close the gap between what people are experiencing, what data, what, what satellites are seeing. Uh, that could be something very, very uh, exciting to explore. So we will not solve this riddle alone. You won't solve it alone. The best way to, to, to move forward is to collaborate and, and keep an open mind with regard to how we can support each other. On to Sheila. Um, have you unmuted? Okay. Yeah. Not, yeah. Can, can you see so, my right. screen? Right. Yes, we can see it. Uh, but before, Sheila, um, please note your questions, your comments. We'll have Sheila, Christy, and then we will take um, comments, please. Thank you. Go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sheila Avalon Colin. I am a physical scientist and an associate professor of Earth and Environmental Sciences at the City University of New York. 
Most of my work focuses on the use of earth observations and machine learning to model natural hazards. I have, in that capacity, I have worked with uh, NASA trying to predict the likelihood of forest fires in Alaska. I have also worked uh, modeling uh, landslides for South and North America, also with NASA and NOAA. And currently, I am working with the uh, New York State uh, Research Authority and the Department of Transportation to analyze the effects of climate change on New York State. And of course, since 2020, I've been uh, working with GEO as co-chair of the subgroup uh, number three. And today I am thrilled to be here uh, with you. And I would like to talk to you about um, the first steps that our group here uh, has been um, trying to accomplish to precisely understand better all of uh, the uh, ideas that Marcus was discussing a few minutes ago. So for our first step, uh, we dove into the scientific literature that highlights the historical and potential hazards that have had and that could potentially present devastating consequences on both the human and the economic side uh, for Jamaica. And in doing so, in this collaboration resulted in a uh, the co we co-authored a literature review paper published on geoscience, uh, the journal MDPI for remote sensing. And we based this the, the framework for this document on the effects of hydrometeorological phenomena uh, in, in, in the cascading event effects that um, it has on the island, but more specifically to landslides and floods. For the time being, we did not focus on geological trigger hazards, but rooted in these two um, hazards, landslides and floods, we wanted to open the conversation about how we can engage international assistance and at the same time, have the involvement of stakeholders in Jamaica. So in this document, we, uh, summarized and described Jamaica's current national disaster framework. Uh, we reviewed the efforts, the current efforts to evaluate the risks. And we overviewed as well the potential earth observation tools, the models and databases that are currently available and that could be applicable to Jamaica as a um, small Caribbean island. We also discussed how earth observation resources and capacity building can benefit and complement the current national disaster framework. So some of the highlights and recommendations derived from this research underline that the risks and relevant adaptation tools, as uh, Marcos mentioned before, are currently limited in Jamaica due to the lack of data, uh, perhaps insufficient temporal and spatial information availability, um, and also technological capacities and probably human resources. And in order to overcome that, we need to work on programs that and strategies that provide society-wide access uh, to earth observation tools. We also need to focus on building international collaborations for multiple, multi, uh, multiple sectoral ownership of disaster risk reduction uh, strategies. And we need to create um, a co-learning and a co-design environment or approach for technological frameworks. And of course, finally, build internal and self-sufficient capacities within Jamaica. So those were uh, the highlights of this document uh, that uh, uh, resulted of our initial collaboration in our group. And um, with this idea of using readily available earth observation data for Jamaica, I like to show you, um, I like to show you a tiny example of some work that can be done with free with a free database 
that uses both gauges and satellites to measure rainfall around the world. Information for this database is available on a daily basis, uh, starting in 1981 all the way to today. It provides a decent spatial resolution and it's named CHIRPS, um, short for the Climate Hazards Group Infrared Precipitation with Stations data. So if we take a look at the past four decades of daily rainfall over the island, we can see trends long and short term. And look at these particular images that um, I'm gonna show you here in this loop. I would like to bring your attention to uh, 2001, 2010. Um, this is by decades. So let me just replay it and pause it right there. Oops. Okay, so this 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 particular one decade was completely different than the others. And although much more analysis and understanding needs to happen before we can determine exactly what happened in the island at that time, it is um, coincidentally, it so happened that 2001, 2010 is, um, or was, uh, the hottest on record since we started taking uh, measurements. Uh, so based on the data provided by CHIRPS, it seems that Jamaica was also affected by the increase in global temperatures. Nevertheless, um, the point here is that CHIRPS was one of those data tools that we looked into our initial research as a potential earth observation that could be helpful for modeling for in, in, in forecasting hazards in the island. So um, of course, future work will encompass uh, doing exactly so. Uh, with this CHIRPS uh, data, we are going to derive flood and drought indices. And of course, um, based on what we are here today, it is our hope that we can work together so we can build that capacity and um, that will be sustainable and will help us in, in Jamaica to become more resilient. And okay, so with all that said, thank you so much for your attention. And I'm going to pass it on to Christy, who will talk to you more about the process of that sustainable development. And um, if you're interested about the whole paper, I'm going to uh, post it in the chat in a couple of minutes. So thank you so much. Thank you, Chilo. Over to you, Christy. And please, just a reminder, note your questions, your comments. We will have a section sometime available for that. Okay, thanks so much for that, Carol. Thanks all. So um, if you can hear me and see my screen well. Okay, perfect, thanks. Yes. So yeah, I'm Christy. I'm a research scientist with um, universities here in Canada. Um, Nathaniel is on the, the west coast of Canada and I'm closer to Toronto, if you're familiar with that, or um, the east coast of Canada. Um, and my background is in space sciences, spacecraft operations, systems engineering. Uh, but several years ago, I turned my focus back to Earth as I felt like this is sort of the time to look. If you're going to use satellites, um, I think using Earth observation and to that end for climate justice and broad equity concerns are of the most important of our time. So my current work is really looking at the ethics and logistics of knowledge co-development. And we'll talk a little bit about co-design and co-development um, and their re and the dynamics at play between um, socio-technological and socio-ecological systems and how to integrate those things. So let's jump right in. Okay, so looking at uh, Lacey that uh, this is a lacy opportunity that Nathaniel mentioned a little bit earlier in the talk. Uh, this is an initiative that our GEO subgroup, those of us who you've heard talk today, um, we saw this opportunity, uh, the 
Latin American and Caribbean initiative, as it is called. Um, and of course, our group saw this and saw that the coordination opportunity was really perfect for the collaborative work that we have been doing and it's been ongoing. So Lacey, as uh, Nathaniel mentioned, is this collaborative effort between the USGCRP, um, Amerigio, USGO, and it's meant to be this um, overarching uh, opportunity for partnerships between um, countries and communities in the Caribbean throughout the region um, and really all throughout the Americas just for capacity building, peer-to-peer -peer learning, developing regional capacities for decision making, internal decision making, really to respond to disasters and impacts from climate change. But you know, moreover, uh, our interest in this initiative is really its approach. The approach is built on co-design. So it seeks to meet those sort of challenges that Marcus really hit on in systemic risk by working together collaboratively. Um, so co-design uh, really focuses on the needs and priorities of a particular region or the partners you're working with in a community, um, but it's not bringing a project uh, to a, a, a region. It's not bringing a design of a particular project, rather the design itself of a project is built on the local approaches, the local knowledges, um, the local agendas. And it's a participatory process, right, where um, the hope is to bring disruptive research um, that we've been talking about today and how that might actually close the gap between that science and actionable um, support on the ground for disaster reduction. Um, and I'll note that, that Lacey started um, this initiative started at the ministerial level from partners in the Latin American and Caribbean regions, specifically for the coordination of international efforts for earth observation uh, for climate change adaptation. So that's really its roots. And so as we, um, in the next slide, we'll, I'll mention a little bit about the, the project that we've started there with um, collaborative efforts and team building with um, people like Carol. Um, what we did was our group I've been talking to you here today, um, everything that we've talked about, the background research, we brought the external analyses of uh, what's been done in the re region, what kind of data is available, um, as Sheila talked about, to support the region in terms of risk and forecasting, modeling assessments. Um, so we took that as a, a first approach as is an equitable approach when you're doing co-development. Um, partners, external partners do the background research, understand um, best we can from the outside, all of the elements at play and do the best research possible, bring all the tools to the table that we can to share. And the next stage in a more mature project um, in terms of co-development, a second stage is actually participatory. So we bring these tools to the table, all the external analyses we've been able to do and, and ask for knowledge sharing. At this phase, phase of the project, really what we do is we sit down and we just listen. <laughs> That's really what we've been doing lately and I'm very much hope to continue. It's been so informative and really fruitful. Um, we just want to hear what the issues actually are, um, not as viewed from the outside, but is happening in Jamaica. What are partners in academia and in government and hopefully in community as we um, as we be able, as we're working closer together and can workshop more um, to learn what's valuable from them. And so a project is co-designed in this way from what we learned from them and developed for going forward. Um, for what's actionable for the region and what actually makes sense, as Marcus talked about, for the lived experiences of the people on the ground. Uh, as for Amerigio, I have this slide in here. Um, so this just kind of offers us an international reach, right? It's a pool of data. It's a pool of know-how, of resources um, to kind of help us springboard and continually grow the project. Um, and as I mentioned on the last slide, um, we're seeking to really have here, systems thinking is transformational. Um, I would say this, <laughs> given my background, but it's really true. Um, we're seeking here, um, as this approach is about creating an overarching system, a national plan for disaster risk reduction and systemic risk 
mitigation and that is sustainable because it involves every sector of society, community, academia, government. Um, and the thinking is that these nodal networks of all of these sectors of society um, coalesce into this uh, larger system um, of ownership and management. So at every level, at every sector of society, um, ownership is taken on of what disaster, uh, what risk really looks like, um, what needs to happen when a disaster strikes, or what, yeah, what other risks need to be mitigated such that um, adaptation can take place when disasters become more and more and more prevalent as are forecasted. Um, so, and one other point on this slide, um, in garnering international resources, as we are trying to work with our many partners, we'll see on the next and almost last slide. <laughs> um, it's not just that we're looking at a particular problem as we've been talking about systemic risk, um, or even just at data, but really looking at garnering resources for people. Um, this is about building capacity. It's about building autonomy. Um, and it's about building a holistic systems approach um, so people can have um, these tools and techniques um, and technologies uh, like Sheila was showing. So next to last slide here and almost completed. Uh, <laughs> this is just a, an example slide, a timeline showing um, what we're doing with the Lacey Initiative and where we are. And currently we're in a proposal stage and this includes you know, the process of co-development um, is reaching out to partners. Uh, we're sitting in listening sessions with our Jamaican partners and really hope that that's a thing we can continue to do. And, and develop uh, more and more partnerships and, and hear more and more people's stories and hear their ideas um, and just allow that space uh, for, for listening and collaborative effort. Um, but at this point, it's mostly reaching out to partners, uh, reaching out to Jamaican points of contact in government and academia, um, and really building the team. And while we're building the team, we're actively sort of developing being the scope of the project together, hearing what's going on, hearing the concerns, hearing um, what's been done before, building on tools, as um, Nathaniel talked about earlier, um, these amazing tools that have already been built in Jamaica and makes this incredible springboard um, to develop a project like this. So how do we keep building on that? And then lastly, how do we, um, how do we indicate what the resource needs are? If, the, if this is something and building a national multi-sectoral disaster risk um, model that's really about the process itself, um, what resourcing does that actually take? Uh, and this is the, the part of the project that we're in, you know, what, what's, what's the ask uh, from an international community, uh, particularly from really vulnerable um, small island developing states um, and nations all through Latin America and the Caribbean, what is the ask? And this is our last slide. I'll just uh, just note here that we are using uh, international guides. What we see here is just um, an excerpt from the UN DRR guidance document for implementing a national strategy for DRR. So we're using these international guides and resourcing, but the real the real point is that we bring it. We want to bring it back to the local and regional scale because you can have the the large overarching international guides and it's excellent for a guide, but what you really have to know where the real work um, and the extensive work happens is in, in the local region or community, understanding how that works on the ground. So that's what we wanna do. We wanna expand the conversation in Jamaica with academics and government, um, with science policy fellows that can act as weavers between those two groups and community. Um, and really help develop a tool that for the first time, you know, um, shows cascading risk in Jamaica, how earth observation can really support these mechanisms and beyond that, a decision-making tool for all levels <laughs> of society, the process itself being the tool. So that's sort of the disruptive um, research that we really hope to bring. Um, I think, so that's my last slide and I just, um, I'll, I'll open it up to my colleagues, but I just want to say again, I'm really appreciative, Carol, for um, you 
offering this um, opportunity for us to come chat with you, with your group, um, with your research group. And we're so excited to, um, to chat with you further about these things. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Christy and the team for, for your presentation. Um, I have some questions, but let me um, just throw it out here because I know my colleagues on the, the, the Zoom here, we have been li listening attentively. So before I, I pose my question, let me invite others to um, interrogate Christy, Marcos, Sheila, and Nathaniel. Anyone? No? Well, one of the things that I, I, I noted here, um, and, and this is for Marcus and Chilo, um, the, 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 cons the, the, the consistency of this data. So yes, we have um, elsewhere where they are able to consistently gather the data and track and monitor and, and all of that. Um, when you started your research, was this an issue for us here in, in Jamaica and perhaps the wider Caribbean, the consistency of the data? And how, if, if it were, it had proven to be an issue, how did you adjust for that? Marcus or Chilo? Um, I mean, Chilo, do you want to maybe kick this off with the chirps data? Yeah, I, I was actually as, going as, based as, on the chirp. As tangible as possible, I think that's the most straightforward way. Yeah, so in the general literature review uh, that we started with, most of uh, researchers who have done any kind of analysis for hazards in Jamaica, uh, they described in many occasion, occasions that they could not build models or they could not do forecasting because exactly that. There was no a coherent um, sequence of data, and uh, also the resolution was an issue. Now, in the second research uh, that I when I showed uh, the chirps data, the chirps data is a global database uh, that uh, uses not only satellites but it also uses gauges. So that means that there are some gauges in Jamaica that are feeding this system. Now the resolution is about five kilometers. Uh, so one pixel will be a five kilometers. That is relatively speaking when you're talking about satellite information, decent. But if we want to do proper forecasting for such a small island and many other islands in the Caribbean, absolutely the best um, forecasting and the best models, they learn from information that we feed them. So, um, the ideal situation would be to have in situ instruments or even radar instruments that can take measurements, let's say, at uh, a one foot resolution. That would be wonderful. And um, if we are capable of developing something like that with Jamaica, whatever uh, results of uh, modeling and forecasting we can develop with you, uh, they will be very strong and sturdy. Mm -hmm. So maybe maybe I can just weird. pipe in. Sorry, Sorry maybe I should just pipe in there. I think that's a great example of where you know we can actually look at data sets not for being you know perfect, but but saying what are the what's the stress test of this data set? You know where does it fail to provide or be useful uh, for various decision making, and how yeah. can we then work together to address that? And I, I think that's the kind of information you know that transfers um, not just for Jamaica, but you know that could. Um, be trans transboundary in nature, right? And yeah. and uh, improve that kind of data set for for a wide range of, of uses. Yeah. So yeah. That, that's one... exactly where I'm going. And Marcus, just put a pause. I see a colleague here, um, Earl Bailey, Dr. Bailey. Um, go ahead, Dr. Bailey, because that is it related to the question I just posed, sir? Um, maybe, I'm not sure. <laughs> but let's, go ahead, let's see. Go ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for the presentation so far. I have a major question slash concern. In dealing with forecasting for disasters, there are three important data sets that are required. First, we need data on the 
phenomena under, under investigation, whether it's a tropical storm, hurricane, whatever it is. And secondly, we need data on the receiving environment. And that environment consists of the, the ecological space and climate and the social, social demographic components of that on that space. What I find is that so far the data has been very, very successful in capturing the first two requirements, data on the phenomena and on the receiving ecological environment. But when it comes to the social data and information, I think many of the challenges we, we faced is our inability so far to properly capture those social dynamics That's and to true. put some metrics to them so they can be used properly with other two sets of data. When we can get to that, that place where we can do that successfully, then I think we can see we'll have, we'll have a, lot, a lot more success in how we address um, impacts and build resilience. But so far, we are far from bringing those, well, the last, the, the, final, the, the third one with the, with the other two. Yes. And that's where I think we need to, to put most of our emphasis on. Yes, quite, quite oh, yeah, so. Yeah. And, and it speaks to the issue of consistency. That's exactly um, which we would have raised, Christy <clears throat> and Nathaniel, in our discussion to say, look, the, the consistency of data at particular level. Right now, we have, um, if you're looking at any data, it's usually at the national level. When you have to come down to the community level, yes, and 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 that's where the impact is based on Marcos, um, you know, presentation. So go go ahead, Marcos. Let us have your interview. Okay, yeah, it's good that you let me talk, because otherwise I forget my answers. Um, <laughs> two two thoughts on that. So I, I fully agree that the ground truth thing is a major concern. The thing is. It's not a major concern around the world, right? Look at drought, right? Uh, I've been working primarily on the African continent where we are always facing, like through the World Bank, the first question is always, who is affected, right? That's, that's sort of a, a saying uh, among the, the meteorologists that I've been working with. We are very good at predicting what will happen, but not very good at predicting what will happen to who, right? And so, Whereas we see a very clear pattern in potentially also Canada, but definitely in the US, definitely in most European countries, that there are drought impact reporting systems that tell you the severity of the drought, what actually happened, yield impacts, socioeconomic impacts, impacts on water infrastructure, water supply, hydropower, tourism. That's all mapped out and it's standardized in time and in space. And we can use it to ground truth our satellite data. So I can go, I can do a high cost, I can do a retrospective historical analysis, and I might see a drought impact in September, and I can check all the data that I, that I have available on record, and maybe already see a pattern in May, and that's exactly what happened in, in several of the cases that I, was, that I was involved in. So why not develop something like that in a standardized format for other places that are not Europe or not the US? That's the first thing. The second thing is about uh, what you call consistency. Uh, I think it goes far beyond consistency. Uh, it goes towards quality, it goes to spatial resolution, it goes to temporal resolution. And the, the interesting example from Sheila made it interesting for me because it's, it talked about this one specific variable, which is rainfall, and one specific sensor technology, which is the church data set that combines the weather stations with, with an infrared sensor. And so I come from a different domain, right? I don't come from infrared sensors at all, which might mean nothing to you if you never if you never thought about or you never got interested in earth observation, and that's absolutely fine. But it's a completely different technologies for different sensors, for different algorithms, for different data set. They are completely different. Right? So why not develop something like an inventory, basically say, this is the data set that provides rainfall, and this is the one that provides temperature, and this is the one that provides soil moisture. These are the applications that we can build based on, the, on these variables, and these are the limitations that we're facing for this particular use case. Right. So in my use case, to make this more tangible, my use case for soil moisture, radar, radar detected soil moisture, 
my data set does not work well if the vegetation is very dense. It does not work well if the topography is super complex and it does not work well in, in arid regions. And these are the, the three things that we need to know. If we have just these two, three main factors that are limiting the use and the development of, of an instrument or of a tool based on this data set, and we built this as an potentially an interactive inventory and then discuss it with stakeholders, then we are one big step further, I believe. Excellent, excellent. Thank you for that. I mean, you know, light bulbs just went off in terms of, you know, possible that inventory. Where are they? What are they showing? And the use. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. The, the floor is open. Let me get some of my other colleagues. Thank you, Dr. Bailey, for posing that. Um, anybody else? My hand is Following up with the, oh, oh, you have another question, Dr. Bailey. I thought that was an old hand. No, I, 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 I see your new hand. hand. This, that's the left hand. The first, the first one was the right hand. <laughs> yes, I'll raise the left hand now. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Yes. Okay. Uh, we mentioned um, the OEC of sustainability, which I think is it's quite pertinent. Um, but I want first to understand what you mean when you use the word sustainability. I'm going to ask a question based on your response. So what do you mean when you use the word sustainability in data usage and application? And when you answer that, I'll, I'll ask my next question. Any of the, the panelists can respond. Christy, maybe you want to? <laughs> no, because I, I want to ensure that we're on the same context here when we use the word sustainability. You know, usually when we talk about, um, thank you, Thank you for that question. It's such an important question to ask to define what this word is to other people and what this means. Um, and I think when we use it in this group, at least in the work that we're doing and when we write about it, we're really thinking about it in the data aspect um, and thinking about these kind of international partnerships that we can leverage. Um, and when we write and when we write in about um, bringing in data sources, what we really try to do is garner um, something that we call sustainable, which is basically an ask to international partners to say that we need some kind of, um, for example, um, a multi-user license for, for data that will provide, that will give a, a long-term data stream um, that is, you know, an equitable funding or low cost funding or no cost funding. Um, and this is the kind of thing that we're trying to work toward with our part with international partners. And I think that is a, is a sustainable model when we're all internationally working together um, to collaborate on data streams and data uses that are not just project specific, that are not going to be just available for one particular project, but are available for a region um, and with uh, international collaboration, um, not only to use that data and to have that data stream, but training available uh, for its use and for its use in modeling. Um, and when these models are built uh, for use in multi-sectors, that training must exist in the first place for it to be implemented in those multiple sectors. So that's part of the sustainability is ensuring that um, that training happens um yeah so i'll pass it on to nathaniel if you yeah just to say really just uh you know enhance what you're saying is that the from my point of view um a lot of reasons why um we've had issues actionizing if that's a word um the systems kind of approach to address systemic risks is because um we work you know primarily as you know project by project in a few years here and there and i think really I'll speak for the team here. Our vision is trying to um, build something with um, with you folks in Jamaica that is a, a, an example to the world of something that um, you know can be further developed, enhanced, yes, but also is built around a vision that is systems and a long term vision of something that's going to last. It's not going to, you know, we're not having to to duplicate and go back again to address certain questions that we can move forward. Um, to really actionize the science. So that's a long answer, I guess, for you there, and, Ed. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> thank you. Also, in one of our previous meetings with Carl, we also discussed sustainability in the sense of capacity building and training the youth of Jamaica. 
because they will become the decision makers of the future. They will become the modelers. They will become <laughs> the people at stake, basically, right? right so right. that's what we mean with sustainability, passing on the baton to the next generations. So they first uh, care about it. They know how to react to it and they're prepared for it. So that's, in my perspective, the sustainability of the project. Also, that when the funding runs out, that it doesn't stop, that it continues and uh, it's, it's, it's reliable um, for the people of Jamaica on a continuous basis. Yeah, thank you. Oh. I have one, one, one other, getting the decision makers to apply the data. <laughs> it's one yeah. thing, Marcos and Christy, when we've, we've done as research scientists, we have collected and we say, this is the model. And um, academia, I mean, we are happy with ourselves because, you know, that's what we do. But for it to be useful, it has to be applied. What are some, how do we overcome that challenge? Because, you know, you have big data, but if it's not applied, it's just big data. <laughs> Uh, I, I have I have I have, I have a thought on on that. Um, I would be I think it's it's the most naive thing that we could do to assume that any kind of decision making process would change because data are there. Right? Decision making processes don't change because there are new, a new data set becomes available. Never. So the only way, in in my opinion, to to communicate the power of, of earth observation driven solutions is to come up with very, very specific, very concrete examples and use cases that are super convincing and a no brainer, right? They, they can't be like a, a, a slight advancement to the status quo. They really need to be groundbreaking and we can provide and we can show these groundbreaking use cases and success. That's great. Um, and I see this, the conversation that we're having right now as an opportunity to show. Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll like to follow on no, the second part of my question. Um, before you get in, before, I see Dr. Friedman Prince. I see her hand. Okay, thank you, Dr. Arjun. Yes, go ahead, please. All right, thank you very much. And, and thanks everyone for your very informative presentation. I would like to just follow up on the question that Dr. Bailey had asked, and I'm specifically addressing it to Sheila in terms of her response with regards to what sustainability actually meant to her. So she had mentioned that it also involves passing on the baton among youth. So I want to find out what opportunities are there for youth to be involved, especially in terms of internship programs, to get involved in the system since it is that you want to pass on this involvement of our youth. In it. So what are the, some of the opportunities that exist or, or possible opportunities that can come out, out of these for Yes. So, yes, we are absolutely talking about possible opportunities for which we are working for. All of this collaboration is uh, going towards that. Some of those collaborations are exchange programs between the students of Jamaica with Canadian and U.S. universities, uh, between the uh, University of Nathaniel and Christie. Um, I don't know if the Harvard Institute yet, but uh, definitely with uh, the City University of New York as well. Classes, training, uh, whether they are online or in person for uh, students in Jamaica. So yes, that's uh, the idea. Okay, so you mentioned about Nathaniel Christian University and, and, and CUNY. So have you started that engagement or that is something that we're thinking of in the future? We have started the first steps. Yes. Okay, and what do you mean by the first steps? Sorry to be lingering. Requesting funding. Yes. Okay. All right. Thanks so much. So mm -hmm. Nadine um, and others, we, we have put together a working group and we have sort of sketched out, you know, what the key things that we need to do and um the the, the and who will be doing what and the role and so forth with the, the view to submitting. That's the um we're looking at submitting um US funding agency, Canadian funding agency. Okay, so we're in the infancy stage. Yeah, we're in the still early stage. I would say it's evolving, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, if you have ideas, uh, Nadine, we, we'd welcome them to okay. have make this work. Yeah. Definitely. Awesome. All, right, All right, thank you. So, right, I see um, Anna Teresa and then um, Dr. Bailey. Go ahead. Hi, everyone. 
And thanks so much for the presentation. Great. Um, but just to follow up on what Marcus was saying, where, uh, where he said that data won't convince anyone. Um, yeah, so I, I agree um, that the data needs to be communicated in a convincing way <laughs> um, to make a, a case right, of why a decision maker needs to apply um, you know, whatever tool. But then again, on the other side, I'm thinking of what's happening now in terms of the, the, the narrative surrounding um, climate change and deniers of climate change. I mean, there are convincing cases everywhere, yet you still have those deniers, right? You have people literally dying um, due to this, but you still have politicians that uh, they refuse to, to put strategies in place or um, build and uh, implement uh, whatever that needs to be done to, to mitigate and adapt um, to these changes, right? Because my, my mind goes back to um, the, in Jamaica's case, uh, the tourism, the Master Plan for Sustainable Tourism Development, right? It's a report for the tourism sector. And um, when I was doing a consultancy for the adaptation communication for Jamaica, I went through this report and what stood out was the recommendation to um, prohibit the ribbon development along the coast, right? Destroying mangroves and all those things. That was a recommendation that was not, um, that was ignored basically, right? So like the evidence is there, but it's not, it's not a must that um, decision makers will take it upon themselves to say, yes, we're gonna do this, you know, and go in the right direction. So I, I think there's still a lot of work to be done in, in, that, in that regard. I don't know if just having a, making a convincing case or communicating a convincing case um, will will be enough. Just to add thank that you, there. thank yeah. you, and Teresa. Um, yeah, lot to be said about that. I'm I'm with you on that. Uh, Dr. Bailey, I know you wanted to to um interject as well, and I see Monique McBean. Go, go ahead, Earl, please. No, it's okay. I will give it to somebody else. Uh, okay, so go ahead. Thank you. Go ahead, Monique. All right. Uh, thanks. Uh, great session, everyone. I just have a question and it's probably best suited for Marcus. I get that it's still early stages, but when and how do you start thinking about like long-term financing for some of these resilience efforts? I'm not sure if Marcus, when and how do we start? Uh, yes, I, I deactivated my video because I, I'm not sure whose connection is still, but I think I got the question. So when when, and how do you start thinking about long-term financing of these activities, right? That was the question. Yes, and yes, the yeah. resilience efforts that's coming out of all of this, or when you identify these are the things that we want to be doing as a country, how do you actually get money in place to do that? Whether it's um, building back after an event or, or preparation to mitigate the impacts yeah i mean first first the first step is to show that things are actually working and to build up the national capacities so that re national risk ownership can actually take place right so first understand what the data mean develop solutions uh show that it works develop use cases build up capacities in parallel and then Think about smart ways to get this funded uh, uh, as a, as a long term endeavor. And I mean, there are several ways to do this directly, and other ways to to do this basically like a sometimes like a Trojan horse uh, activity. Basically, uh, I've seen different different activities embedded in large climate grants. Even in the uh, Green Climate Fund activities, 
simply because they provide the financial volume to build up capacities that go far beyond the duration of a project. That still means that uh, all these activities that we're talking about, they need to be backed and they need to be owned by the government. And I, I mean, there are several discussions ongoing to position Jamaica as a role model in the region, which would be a very interesting use case also from a, from a governmental perspective, because I really think that Jamaica has the capacity or could be built up to have the capacity to play this important role in the region. So if we have the use case, then it's easier to scale things up and it's easier to, to, uh, to show to potential donors that what we're doing in a small scale is very relevant at the larger scale. And once that step is accomplished, usually, at least what, 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 from what I've seen in the past, this is when, when uh, large donors really get interested to, uh, to develop a system that goes far beyond the duration of a project if we can ensure that it is truly owned by the government. If we can, if we can really ensure that it has an added value. Thank, thank you, thank you, Marcus. Um, folks, we are right on time um, as we had uh, organized. So, Christy, we leave it to you to have the last intervention. I'm not seeing any hands raised for questions or comments. So, Christy, to you as we wrap up. Thank you. Thanks so much, Carol. Um, just thinking, listening to these comments, I uh, wanted to speak again to um, Anne Teresa's point about this narrative surrounding, surrounding climate change and how do you make a convincing use case if what's already happening isn't convincing enough for policymakers to make a difference. Um, and maybe we can take on sort of the, the Lacey's theme and learn from partners all through the Americas something that Canadian Indigenous communities are doing and, and, and just have been doing for a long time are these listening sessions. And if we take a cue from them, um, what they do is workshop together with all sectors, bring in government um, policymakers, and it's really about building relationship first. So if you, build, if you start from building relationship with people, instead of making asks, instead of trying to just move forward with the project, um, just get everybody together in the same room and talk, and it makes it personal. And once that personal connection is made between all players, um, then maybe some headway can be made. Maybe some um, of these frameworks that we develop can become actionable when it's based on relationship. So that might be a play out of a playbook that could be really useful um, for us to learn from. Um, and hopefully, from that, actually, uh, yeah, do show this incredible capacity that already exists in Jamaica, build on that, and then um, integrate these into policy, make that actionable at the policy level, and then at the international level, garner long-term, more sustainable funding. Yes, yes. And um, so, folks, we are up on time. I, I see chat going on. This is the um the, the first step but we will con continue the collaboration with the lacy group and with the geo um group so we, we we you will hear more about us regarding those um developments please please stay tuned look out for the next in the series from the faculty of the built environment where we have concert, con, conversation around pertinent issues associated with our research activities. So I want to thank you all for coming. Um, it's been good. Well, our con conversation and work will continue, Christine, Nathaniel, and Sheila, and others. And um, for my colleagues, thank you for coming and participating. And again, look out for um, further posting about our seminar series. But Thank thanks you so much, and Carol. enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye everyone. Bye bye. So much. Bye bye. bye.